Bruchem Aboim, thank you very much for attending and welcome to our home. The uh, topic of tonight's My Thought is Torah the Key for Life. So, is it life or is it is the uh, is life or is it better yet? I think the topic should be living. Life isn't really enough. Are we commanded by God to live, or is that just a suggestion? If we look into the Torah in the third book of the portion, in the, third, in the portion of Akharimot, it states that you shall keep my statutes and laws, since it is only by keeping them that a person can truly live. Ani Hashem, I am God. So this verse is informing us that the only way for us to truly live life is by following the instruction manual, the Torah, that God, our benevolent Father, has given us. In fact, the word Bible is an acronym for a book of instruction by which to live on earth. The verse begins with the Hebrew word, Ushmartem, and you shall keep my statues. Now, the word Shamar means to keep or guard. It also alludes to looking forward, anticipating the time one would be able to perform a mitzvah. We learn this fact from Yosef in his dream. Uh, we read in the book of Genesis, in the portion of Vayeshev, where Yosef tells his father his dream. There it states, V'aviv shomer es adavar. And Yaakov, his father, waited for the dream to come true. So the verse is telling us, that not only should we keep God's commandments, but that we should basically look forward to the opportunity to be able to fulfill them. Now, the verse begins with the command to keep the chukim, the statutes, laws without any reason, and only then does the term mention the mishpatim, the civil laws, uh, those laws that are, are logical and, and necessary for the survival of a society. The chukim deal with Torah laws, and the Mishpatim deal with what we call derech eretz, civil laws, common decency. As it states in the Ethics of the Fathers in Pirkei Ovot, Yafa Talmud Torah im derech eretz, that it is good to combine learning Torah with one's occupation. They shouldn't be separate. The verse continues with the command that a man should yase osam, perform them. The Hebrew word osam has the same Hebrew letter as the word emet, truth, an allusion to the fact that a person's actions should be a reflection of their Torah knowledge. If they are able, so to speak, to talk the talk, then they should be able to walk the walk. That a person must live their life with emes, with truth. What if they make truth the foundation of their life? Then v'chai b'hem. Then they will be, have the opportunity to live a long and productive life. Does all this mean that we have to be OCD in our relationship with God Almighty? You know, when Menachem of Breslov was a young man, he tried to observe all the commandments with all their stringencies. He then realized that the proper way to serve God is to choose to observe one mitzvah. One mitzvah, but with all of its absolute stringencies. All the other mitzvot, one should follow, but only in accordance with the normative law presented in the Shulchan Aruch the code of Jewish law. You know, they tell a story about a man who was a thief and a lowlife. He came to the realization that he needed to change his lifestyle, and so he went to see a Rebbe. He approached the Rebbe and began to tell him about all of his many sins. He expressed a true desire to do tshuva, to repent. However, he told the Rebbe that keeping all 613 commandments of the Torah was way above his capabilities. The Rebbe nodded his head as a sign that he understood the thief's dilemma. The Rebbe thought for a moment, then he looked at the thief with a smile. He said, can you keep one mitzvah? The thief repeated, one mitzvah, with a quizzing look on his face, as if to ask if maybe he hadn't heard the Rebbe correctly. Now the Rebbe repeated once again, just one mitzvah. Well, the thief smiled and nodded his head. One mitzvah, one mitzvah, that I can do. The Rebbe told him that the one mitzvah that you have to observe is never to tell a lie. The thief said, that's it? The Rebbe nodded his head and he said, yes. Fast forward one year. A stranger enters the Rebbe's study hall to pray with the Hasidim. Somehow he looked familiar to some of them, but they just couldn't remember from where. 
He had a beard, black suit, white shirt. He certainly looked and acted like an Orthodox Jew. The stranger noticed that they were looking at him. And so, and so he walked over to them with a big smile on his face. He said to them, you don't recognize me, do you? And they had to admit that though he looked familiar, no one really knew who he was. He said to them that he was the thief that had come to see the Rebbe the previous year. They said, how is that possible? The Rebbe told you that you only had to keep one mitzvah, and yet here you are. You seem to be a truly observant person. He smiled and said, let me tell you what happened. Well, as you can imagine, all the Hasidim huddled in closer. They didn't want to miss a word of his story. And so he began. When I left here, I, I was somehow feeling better than I had in a long time. In fact, maybe ever. So I was on my way to burglarize someone's house, and I happened to bump into my friend Harry. He asked me where I was going. Well, before I could reply, I remembered my promise to the Rebbe. So I said, I was on my way to burglarize Tom's house. I was still on my way to Tom's house when I met another friend of mine. <laughs> he too asked me where I was going. And again, I couldn't lie, so I told him that I was on my way to burglarize Tom's house. Well, after I told two people about my intent to burglarize Tom's house, I just went home. Then one thing led to another, tefillin, Shabbos, kosher, and here I am now, a practicing Orthodox Jew. The Torah here uses one of the four names that refer to a man. Adam is the name the Torah uses to refer exclusively to a Jewish man. When the Torah states ha-adam, with a he at the beginning of the word, it then includes non-Jews as well. The Orchayim HaKadosh states, in the name of Rabbi Yirmiya, that the additional he at the beginning of the word adam is an indication that non-Jews are included in the term adam, man, only if they learn the 24 books of the Torah. Now this is alluded to by the gematria of the Hebrew word v'chai, and lit, which is 24. The verse continues with the Hebrew words v'chai v'ham, and you shall live by them. The only way that a Jew can live their life fully is by connecting to the 24 written books of the Torah, what we refer to as Tanakh. Uh, let us examine what the commentaries tell us about living with the Torah. The Talmud in the Tractate of Sanhedrin learns from here that if the performance of a mitzvah puts one's life in jeopardy, they should forego the mitzvah, so as to be able to live and perform many more other mitzvahs. Now this refers to all commandments in the Torah other than three cardinal sins that one is required to give up their life for. They are murder, idol worship, and sexual improprieties. Now, they tell a story of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. One time during the high holidays, the city of Salat was struck by an epidemic and many people were dying. The doctors were concerned that if the Jewish population would fast on Yom Kippur, that it might cause the death of many. So rather than just tell his congregation to eat on Yom Kippur, Rabbi Yisrael went to the front of the synagogue and made Kiddush on a cup of wine, and then he drank it before the eyes of all of his followers. B'chai b'hem, and live with them. The Ralbach states, based on the Talmud and Yuma, that these words teach us that one may violate any commandment of the Torah to save a life. The Talmud and Yuman also states, desecrate one Shabbos for his sake so that he will be able to observe many other Shabbosim. This law applies even if we are certain that the patient will die shortly and will not have the opportunity to keep any more Shabbosim. The fact that the Talmud mentions Shabbos is only as an example since it is one of the mitzvot that represent all the mitzvot in the Torah in general. So the patient may not live out the week or even the day, but we may still, but he, but he, pardon me, may still be able to perform some other mitzvot, or at least to chua, repent. It is possible that with his dying breath, he may earn his portion in the world to come. You know, there's a story told in the Talmud, in the tractate of Avodah Zarah, about a person called the Lazar ben Dordoi. It states there that there was not one prostitute in the towns by the sea that he had not visited. After a visitation with one of these women, she passed gas. She turned to him and said that just as that gas can never return, 
so too your repentance will never be accepted. Taking her words to heart, he then turned to the mountains and asked them to pray for him. They said they had their own problems and that they couldn't pray for him since they were involved in their own prayers. He then turned to the heavens and asked them to intercede on his behalf. They too declined. He then turned to the earth and then the sun and the moon and the stars, but they all answered with the same answer, that they too had their own problems and that they couldn't help him. So with no other alternative, he bent his head down between his knees and cried bitterly. He did so until his soul departed. After he died, a heavenly voice was heard proclaiming, Rebbe Elazar ben Dordoy is destined for life in the world to come. When Rebbe, the editor of the Mishnah, heard this story, he cried, saying that I've spent my whole life trying to reach my final reward, and yet there are those who can earn eternal life in an instant. He also said not only that, but he was even given the title of rabbi by the heavenly voice. What do we learn from this story? Never give up. Who knows? <laughs> you might actually succeed. In addition, not only a deathly ill patient, but even one who is in a coma, also receives a reward for being a holy object, a conduit, through which other people perform the mitzvot of kindness and helping the dead. The smog states that the concept of keeping many more Shabbosim may not be referring to the person who is dying at all. It may be referring to the first responder, the one who is trying to rescue a person in danger. As a reward for his concern and actions on behalf of the sick or dying person, he deserves to be given more life, a reward so that he can continue to keep many more Shabbosim. As we have been told by our sages, God created this world with only one person to teach us that if you save one life, it's as if you have saved the whole world. However, Rashi on this verse states that this refers to life in the world to come. So, so how do we reconcile these two statements? If one lives their life properly, then the only difference between this world and the next is one's physical body. Rav Shimshu Rafal Hirsch says that death is not the termination of existence but rather the termination of existence in this world, much like the existence of a baby in and out of its mother's womb. This is also why we, when we make a toast, we say l'chaim, to life. But the Hebrew word l'chaim is plural. So in reality, we are toasting to lives, plural, which is an allusion to life in this world and life in the world to come. Rabbi Yosef Albo states that there can be no question that the Torah speaks of life of the soul as opposed to life of the body, since the soul's existence is eternal and the body is only temporary. This is simply one of the places in Torah where a spiritual reward for observing a Torah commandment has been spelled out. The first part of the verse deals with Torah, and the last part of the verse with life in this physical world. Now the verse ends with the Hebrew words, Ani Hashem, I am the Lord. This is in reference to God in his dimension of mercy, the Yudke Vavke. The only true existence is for us to connect to the source of life, our Father in Heaven. Our rabbis tell us that making a shidduch, a marriage con arrangement, is as difficult for God as the splitting of the Red Sea. You know, it seems strange that the sages would compare the division of something whole to the combining of two separate entities. What is it that they are trying to teach us? that at certain times in order for us to join two opposites together, we must first be willing to bend, cut, reshape certain features so that the two opposites can come together to form one unit. So two in marriage. For a marriage to succeed, both partners must be willing to change, to compromise, to concede. This then is the only way for them to succeed in forming a harmonious relationship. And so too, must we include in our relationship with God Almighty the willingness to adjust our needs, our wants and desires, in the hope that we can become one with God and not selfish, self-centered individuals who have no bond with their Creator, based on Moshe Swift. You know, I would like to end this discussion with a true story about doing just one simple mitzvah and how it saved the life. 
And there was an Orthodox family that had missed their bus to B'nai Brock. It was late Friday afternoon and they were standing outside the bus station in Jerusalem, wondering how they were going to get home before the Shabbat. It just so happened that a 17-year-old secular Israeli was driving by and he noticed the religious family standing at the curb. He realized that they were stranded and he asked them if they needed a ride. They gratefully accepted his invitation and he drove them to their home in the B'nai Brak. They arrived just before the Shabbat and he was about to drive off. The father asked the young man if he would spend the Shabbat with his family. Well, at first, he politely refused. After all, he, he wasn't religious. But the father insisted, and finally he said, you know, he wanted to repay the young man back for his kindness. And so the young man finally agreed, and he stayed for the whole Shabbat, and even from Malaba Malka after the Shabbat, Shabbat ended. As the young man was saying his goodbyes to the family, he turned to the father and said, you know, this Shabbat was great. I really enjoyed myself. He then asked the father if maybe there was some small mitzvah that he could perform that would remind him of this wonderful experience. But he stressed that he wanted something that his secular friends wouldn't tease him about. The father thought for a moment, and then he smiled. He said, I have the perfect mitzvah for you. The Code of Jewish Law states that when putting on one's shoes, one should always put on the right shoe first, because the right shoe alludes, the right, pardon me, alludes to kindness. Then we put on our left shoe. The left is always an allusion to severity. However, once they are both on his feet, he should reverse the order and tie the left shoe first and then the right. The father explained that we always show preference to the right side over the left. However, when it comes to tying, the order is reversed. Since we first fasten our tefillin on our left arm, so we show preference to the left over the right when it comes to tying. The young man was happy with both the mitzvah and the explanation. So unbeknown to his secular friends, he began to keep this mitzvah religiously. From time to time he would forget and mix up the order, but he religiously tried to keep the mitzvah. If he realized that he had erred in the order they putting them on, he would excuse himself and start all over again. Sometimes later, he was drafted into the Israeli army. While he was on, in basic training, his company went out to the parade field to go on maneuvers. It just so happened that while standing around waiting for the helicopter to arrive, he remembered that he had put on his left boot before putting on his right boot. He knew that if he told the captain the truth, the captain would think he was crazy. And so he told the captain that he had a migraine headache and that he needed to return to the barracks to get some aspirin. The captain told him to hurry back, since they were scheduled to leave shortly. And so, he returned to his barracks, took off his combat boots, and then put them back on properly. He hurried back to his company, but they had already left. He had missed the helicopter. That day, Rachman al-Litzlan, God should tell mercy, two Israeli helicopters collided, collided in midair, killing all 73 young Israeli soldiers that were on board. This young man was not one of them because of a simple mitzvah. Today, he is a full-fledged Baal Tshuva who embodies the concept of Vachai Bahem, lived through them. Mitzvahs are not only his life, but they actually gave him his life. It always strikes me odd that people are so afraid of becoming religious. One of my family members went to Israel for the first time you know, I couldn't wait to hear all the stories about their trip to the land of our people. When they returned, they talked about their experience. All they could say over and over again was so much poverty, so much poverty. That was all that they said. It was all that they saw. Somehow, we see what we want to see, and many times we miss the beauty in life. On a personal note, being religious has made me a better person in every, every arena in my life. It has helped me be a better husband, father, sibling, boss, friend, the list goes on. I thought that when I first became religious that I would be giving up so many things. Instead, I found that everything that I did somehow got better. It has put a smile on my face that seldom leaves. <laughs> I sometimes wonder if I sleep with a smile. Being religious means never being alone. 
I, I'm not referring to God Almighty, our Father who is with us constantly. I'm referring to the friends that we make in our communities, real friends, not just for the good times. They don't leave when troubles come. They stand with you until the end. The friends that I've made over the years since I've become a Balchuva have been amazing and very real. The love that Judaism demands from us is real and tangible. It's not judgmental or callous. People really care. They care because that is what God, our Father in Heaven, demands of us in His Torah. The Ahavta, the Riachal Kamocha. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, there's no greater joy that a parent can experience other than seeing that his children love and care for one another. Every person has precious treasure buried deep within them. Sometimes, to be able to reach it, you have to get a little dirty. But we can never give up. We don't have the permission to give up. We just have to dig a little deeper, and then we will find it. More than ever, we all need to live life. We can't give up on life. We can't, give, we can't live in fear. We most certainly don't have the right to give up on each other. If we give up on each other, then we allow God Almighty to give up on us. And that can never happen. So as a Tzemach Sedek would say, Trach good, will sein good. Think good, and it'll be good. So if life is a door that we must all walk through, then the key that opens that door is the Torah. And with that thought in mind, let us pray for a truly meaningful, peaceful, and lengthy existence with the coming of Mashiach Sukena may come quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for listening, for attending. God should bless you with happiness and health and safety and only good. And Shabbat Shalom again. Thank you.